All right, guys. Uh, yeah, so we got disconnected. <laughs> uh, I, I ran into some internet issues. So let's, uh, yeah, let's resume this here. I'll go ahead and share my screen again. Uh, we run into technical issues sometimes. So yes, so that's what I was saying, right? So use the exam outline. The exam outline helps you to study. So I know under for example, general insurance definitions. I have to know what is domestic, foreign, alien insurance companies. I have to know what is stock insurance company, what is a mutual insurance company. I know I need to know what is what is certificate of authority. So use this, and it gives you details um, on everything exactly what to study. So use this again when you take my course. You're going to have all of this um, included in a course for you. All right, so let's get back here to our PowerPoint. So that's the first thing that you want to do. Um, the first thing you want to do is, is you want to look at the exam outline, okay? Review the exam outline and use that as a guide for you to be able to study. Then the next thing you want to do is you want to schedule your exam before you start. Now, some states require pre-licensing. What that means is some states require you to go through an approved licensing course, and you have to go through everything, pass your final exam, get a certificate of completion before they can allow you to schedule your exam. Some states do that. About 24 out of the 50 states do not have that requirement. So you can go online and schedule your exam today. For example, off the top of my head, Washington DC doesn't do that. You know, you don't need to go to any formal uh, training program uh, in Washington DC. You can schedule your exam today and go and take your exam tomorrow, right? So, so, so that's good for you. I know, for example, Texas, um, the state of Texas uh, doesn't, have any licensing requirement or you know, pre-licensing requirement. So if your state doesn't have that, you want to go ahead and schedule. Why you want to do that? Again, I, I told you guys earlier, I've been doing this for slightly over 10 years. And one of the biggest obstacles to people passing your exam is procrastination. Procrastination, procrastination, procrastinator. So by scheduling your exam up front before you even start studying, that gives you a deadline to, uh, you know, to work towards like, oh crap, I schedule my exam for two weeks from now. So I know I have to be on my A game. I have to study because I have a deadline to meet because you know what? Not only, well, if you don't take your exam, then for example, for the state of um, DC, technically DC is not a state, but anyway, you get my point. <laughs> for the state of DC, you're going to need, uh, you know, it's, it's $75 to register for the exam. So now you have $75 on the line, which I mean, it's not a lot of money, but you know, it's, you know, it's still something, right? So you don't want your $75 to go to waste. So now you have a deadline, you're going to have pressure to be able to complete your study on time. If you don't do that from my experience, Sometimes, again, I have a big team, I have team members. So, oh yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take my exam next month. Then next month comes, oh, you know, something came up, something blah, 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 I'll take my exam next month. And if six months go by, I have one of my team members, it's been one year now, still can get his license, but every day is something else, <laughs> something else, something else. So scheduling your exam before you even start studying, um, puts a deadline down and it helps to at least get rid of procrastination because now you have a deadline to work towards. So for, if you take those pre licensing, that's something I require. Next thing uh, I suggest is to commit to a fixed study schedule. The same way you have fixed time for everything, right? I have a, I have a fixed time to, to go to bed because I know or oh, I have to wake up six o'clock to go to work. So I have to be in bed no later than maybe 12 midnight. And you have a fixed time to, to go to work. Hey, I know 
I work Monday to Friday from nine to five. So I know crap, nine o'clock or eight o'clock, I must be out of the house. I don't care unless it's an emergency, I must be at work, <laughs> right? So treat your exam preparation the same way. The same way you have time to work, you have time, you, you set out special time to work, special time to sleep, carve out special time to study. If not, you're gonna find out that you're gonna keep being distracted. You, you say, oh yeah, I'm gonna study today, but you don't have a specific time. Your best friend calls you and then you say, oh, I'll just talk to this person for five minutes. And five minutes end up being two hours or you're watching your favorite uh, Netflix uh, series, for example, for me, <laughs> Money Heist is by far my favorite, uh, you know, by far my favorite Netflix movie, Money Heist, by far, by far my favorite um, Netflix movie uh, or Netflix series. I mean, it's crazy. I know one time I stayed up until 4 a.m. watching Money Heist, I, I, I knew I, you know, I, I had to go to bed because I had a nine o'clock appointment, but I was so glued <laughs> and I just couldn't walk away. <laughs> so, but, but the thing is, if you don't have a fixed study schedule, you say, oh, you know, let me just watch this for a little bit. Uh, let me watch this Netflix series for a little bit or this Netflix movie. And when you look, it's been four or five hours wasted that's time you could have used to study. So mark a special time, like, okay, you know what I say, from Monday to Friday, I'm studying three hours. I'm studying maybe from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. 6 p.m., I'm turning my phone off. I don't care who's calling me, I'm turning my phone off, I'm turning the TV off, I'm going in my room or I'm going in my, you know, in my living room or wherever you, you have to study or, you know, wherever or maybe I'm going to Starbucks to study. I'm turning my phone off, no distractions. So this one, you are not even at home. And I recommend if you have a library or Starbucks, it's better to go there because you are home. There always be distractions. Maybe your kids, your family members, you no know, TV, all of that. For some of you, the refrigerator, <laughs> it's a distraction. So just get rid of uh, you no know, distraction. So set a special, study schedule that will help also to get rid of uh, procrastination and then you want to also get an accountability partner think about an accountability partner as a as a gym buddy as an exercise buddy someone to hold you accountable like i know um years ago i used to have an exercise buddy right uh, no i used to have a workout buddy so Sometimes it's winter time, it's, it's snowing and it's freezing cold outside. I'm like, oh my God, I don't feel like going to the gym. I don't feel like working out. And six o'clock in the morning, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm getting a call from my friend. Hey, are you up yet? <laughs> Let's go to the gym, man. I'm here waiting for you. I'm like, oh God. Oh God, I'm tired, but you know what? I'm gonna drag myself because I have someone who I don't wanna let down. I have someone holding me accountable. But if I didn't have that, oh no, uh, winter time, six o'clock, it's snowing outside. I'll just, you know, <laughs> put myself under my comforters and that's it, you know, I ain't leaving anywhere. So that's, that's why you wanna have a study buddy, someone that can hold you, accountable you you make a time okay uh you know what we're studying mondays wednesdays and fridays from um i don't know from 5 p.m to 8 p.m that person now you're accountable to that person right that trust me helps a lot so those are the things you got to do before you start studying now what are things to do during your study and after your study number one you want to follow our TADS20 strategy. What that means? That means that you should spend no more than 20% um, of your time passively studying. That's you reading you know, the material or you're looking at it. So no more than 20% of your time. 80% of your time should be spent doing 
practice questions after practice questions, simulated exams after simulated exams, because that's the best way to trigger your brain, to force your brain to learn and remember. Okay, so that's active, uh, that's active study. So 80% of your time on questions, 20% on reading material. And that is how we structure our training course. Our training course is not like some of the other exam providers where I saw one of them one time, I won't call their name. I mean, 540 pages. I'm like, oh my God, 540 pages for your life and health insurance exam. I mean, I saw it, no, and I, and I consider myself a very disciplined and committed guy, right? But when I saw the size of the book, it just scared the hell out of me. I'm like, nah, 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 I ain't studying that. So don't even waste your time because here's the thing, the, for the study material, a lot of people don't know, only about 40% of what, 40 to 60% of what is in the study material will actually show up on your exam for most of those uh, exam providers. Only about 40 to 60% of the material will actually show up on your exam. So you're spending all this time and you want to understand and you know, be an expert at every single chapter and every single paragraph in a 540 page book. By the time you look, it's been two months and you're still not prepared to take your exam. So with our strategy, we, we go to the exam outline, then we use that to draw our questions. And now you're using the questions to study, but instead of just passively reading and falling asleep, you are testing yourself and you're triggering the brain to go into hard drive. And your brain remembers more, remembers faster when it's in hard drive. Okay, so our, 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 our study strategy, our, our exam prep strategy is questions, 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 questions with a little bit of notes for study. The, the second thing is doing your study, you wanna study in a quiet environment and we recommend Baroque, classical music. Again, uh, with that, it's been proven by research, you know, it, it, it helps to increase your concentration, you know, it, you know, it decreases your resting heart rate, and it just increases focus and concentration more and helps with memory also. So while you're studying, you can go to YouTube on your computer, or on your cell phone, you, you, know, you put your ear piece in, you know, uh, and you're listening to Baroque classical music while studying. That will just help to speed up your uh, memory uh, retention. The next thing is you want to, while you're studying, you want to practice time management. So doing your simulator exams, I'm sorry, my mouth is getting a little dry. Let me get a sip of water. So doing your simulator exam, you want to, practice time management because the best time to prepare for your exam is not in the exam hall, it's why you're studying. So as I said earlier, no more than, no more than, um, no, you should not spend no more than one minute on any given question. And you can use the practice questions, you can use the simulated exams. For those of you who decide to sign up for our course, you can use that and be able to gauge yourself, okay? Then, next thing is you wanna score at least 80% on two simulated exams in a row. The simulated exams will, you know, and that's just what it says, simulated, right? So it's gonna simulate the actual exam. So the actual exam, for example, in the state of Washington, D.C. is two hours. So it's gonna be two hours. Uh, I think it's gonna be about 95 questions. It's gonna simulate that. And you're gonna have two hours to answer 95 questions and the same exam, you no know, breakdown, the ratio, everything, you know, the percentages for each chapter, the kind of questions you're gonna get on your actual state exam. So we'll have that. So the goal is score, your goal is to score 80% on at least two simulated exams in a row. If you can score two simulated, you know, score 80%. On two simulated exams in a row, that tells you you're prepared for your exam. Once that's the case, you want to go ahead and take your exam within 72 hours because all of the material is still fresh in your head. 
last but not the least, which I think is the most, is the most important thing you can do to help you pass your exam. Please get at least seven hours of sleep the night before your exam. I'll give you a, uh, a personal story. When I was in pharmacy school, this was a long time ago, and I was in pharmacy school, I, I mean, I stayed up studying for uh, one of my exams. I think it was, uh, it was um, an immunology exam. Uh, that was my midterms. I was so freaked out, like, oh my God, I can't afford to lose, I can't afford to fill this exam. I must pass this exam. So I stayed up all night and my friends would tell me, hey, Biko, go and get at least five hours of sleep. I'm like, oh, no, 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 I have so much material to cover. So I only got two hours of sleep before the exam, two hours of sleep. And I went <laughs> in the exam hall. I'm telling you, I kid you not, that was the first time I experienced something like that ever in my life. I had a complete blackout, a complete brain freeze. It's, it is as if everything I learned the night before or the last two days just vanished. I couldn't retrieve anything. My, my brain was just frozen. And that was the exam. Even though I really studied harder than most of my classmates, I mean, I put in, I don't know, over 20 hours just preparing for that exam because it was midterm. No, I spent a whole weekend studying for that exam. But I got the lowest score of my entire life, not just college, the lowest score of my entire life. I think I scored 40% on that exam. And that taught me a very important lesson that sleep is very important because when your mind, when your body is completely rested, you give your brain the opportunity to rest and rewire all those things you learn, you know, to form all those connections in your brain, all those micro um, um, neurons, all those synapses. It gives your, your brain the chance to pull everything together for it to be easily available for you to retrieve. So no matter what you do, if you think you are not prepared, you can always reschedule your exam, but do not do an all-nighter the day before your exam. You're gonna be doing yourself a big disservice. I've seen a lot of people who spend a lot of time, three weeks, four weeks studying for the exam, but they didn't get enough rest the night before the exam and they went and bombed the exam. You don't want that uh, to be you. So get at least seven hours of sleep. If you can get more, eight, nine hours, that's even better, but at least seven hours of sleep the night before your exam. That could be the difference between passing and failing. Just the number of hours of rest you get could be the difference between you passing your exam and you failing your exam. You can do everything we lay out for you. But if you don't get enough sleep, you just increase your chance of failing your exam. So those are tips to help you pass. Now, next thing here, mental pass is here for you. Okay, we are, you know, we are, we're, we're, we're here for you to take you to where you want to be. Now, uh, I've, I've already talked about our, um, I'm, I'm sorry, our T80, it says the T20, our T80, S20, and active recourse strategy. That's one of the things that set us apart from a lot of exam prep providers. Okay, so means of pass, that's our innovative strategy has worked. I, you know, I, I, I know it really worked because one of um, the guys I was helping before, uh, it, it took him, I think it took him almost six, six weeks to prepare for his life insurance exam using the traditional study strategy, which he had to read all the material, master it, and do, do a few practice questions. But with our T80 um, 
S20 strategy and our active recall strategy, I told him, hey, what about you try something different? Because he kept complaining, oh, I don't have time. You know, I'm, I'm busy, I'm, I'm working full time and I'm going to school full time, I don't have time. So I told him about our strategy and he agreed to try out. He took two and a half days and passed his health insurance exam. Compare that with almost six weeks for passing his life insurance exam and he barely passed. But two and a half days, he passed his uh, health insurance exam with flying colors. So our strategy works. The only question is, are you willing to follow it? Okay, or follow them. So the means of pass advantage. What, are, what sets us apart? Number one, we'll, we'll have a private Facebook group. So that private Facebook group gives you the opportunity to, um, you know, it gives you the opportunity to join our online community. You can find your accountability partners, your study partners. You can network. You can get help from your fellow students or help from me. But private Facebook group. And of course, we're gonna have um, you know, some live teachings um, you know, on Facebook. And you're forming a community, not just for your exam, but you can even use that to network later on, even find a job, uh, you know, all of that. You, know, you can never go wrong with networking. So the, the private Facebook group. The next thing we have is we're gonna have a podcast. So the podcast, like a regular podcast, you're gonna listen to everything on the go. For example, what I'll start to teach in a few minutes, this will be on our podcast. So now a lot of people uh, are leading busy, busy lives. You're always on the go. You're either working, you're in school, you're driving, you're exercising, you're doing something. <laughs> so the podcast comes in handy because while you're going about your everyday life, you, you're still learning. So you, you know, put in your earphone, you're listening to the podcast while you're exercising, cooking, driving, working out, whatever. Then the third option, of course, this is one of, uh, you no, know, this is what you're watching right now if you're on YouTube, is we're gonna have video uh, tutorials on YouTube and on webinars. So for some of you who would like to see, who like the visual learning, that works for you. For people who like more, uh, you no, know, who, who like more auditory learning where they got to listen, you know, that helps them with learning. We have the podcast. Then for those of you who want more one-on-one -on -one help, okay, like, okay, I don't want a group thing. I want, you no know, one-on-one -on -one teaching. We can also offer that. And for those of you who say, yeah, I mean, I really don't care about listening. I really don't care about video. I'm, I'm more of a physical book kind of person. I want to have a printed material. I want to flip pages. I want to highlight. I want to circle, make comments, all of those things. You want to print that material? That will also be available um, to you, uh, printed study material. And I think the other thing, major thing that sets us apart from almost all of our competitors is we have post-exam health because you are about to embark on a um, journey into a new industry, which is the insurance industry. So yes, we will help you pass your exam, but in addition to that, we are here for you every step of the way along this journey. Whether it's applying for your license, if you need help with that, uh, help with that if it's a job search. Okay, so now you have your license, you need to find a job, right? Do you need help with finding a job? We can help with that. Or if you want to create your own insurance business, I talked about that earlier. That is the way to make a lot of money in the insurance industry, creating your own insurance business. So if you need help setting that up, if you want to become a business partner, we can also do that. So these six things make up the means of pass advantage. So I wanna tell you, thank you very much. So now we're gonna 
go into our actual exam prep, our actual teaching. Again, for some of you who didn't want to waste time, you missed a lot of good things. No, some of you skipped forward. <laughs> you missed a lot of good things. But let's go now into our exam, um, our exam prep. All right, so yeah, we are here for the exam prep. So as you can see here, our, our exam prep is divided into chapters, but the chapters are based on the um, exam content. So you see right here, so you see for the exam content, for example, it'll say um, one types of policies, then um, yeah, you're gonna have here, um, two policy riders, provisions, options, and exclusions. Then three, three you have completing the application, underwriting, and delivering the policy. So, so that's the same way we structure our training material. So let's come here. And just just one thing for for those of you who would like to get a notification when we're finished preparing the course because we're preparing the course right now we should be finished pretty soon for those of you who want to be notified for those of you who live in washington dc because the first course we're preparing is for just the washington dc um, life insurance exam but if you're in another state and you would like us to create a course for your state life insurance exam or health insurance exam, then fill out the survey right here, okay? So the survey is gonna ask you just basic information, your email, your name, phone number, uh, what state you live in, uh, you know, what month you're gonna you know, take your exam. Then it's gonna, you know, just, just basic question, I'm gonna take you no more than five minutes to fill this out, okay? So, so when you fill this out, then for, for everyone else, I'm, I'm gonna look at the total number of um, um, survey tickers. And I'm gonna see, okay, for example, if I got 50% of the people who took the survey are from the state of California and they want us to create uh, an exam prep for the state of California. Then I say, oh, 50% of people want us to create an exam for the state of California. Then we're going to go ahead and, and create an exam for the state of California, right? So if you fill out a survey, you're increasing the chance of us creating an exam prep for your state. All right. So fill this out. You're going to have to link in the description. If you're on YouTube, you're going to have to link. Uh, in the description, if you're listening to this on the podcast, again, you're going to have the link in the description. So let's come here to chapter four. We're, we're starting in reverse, actually. Uh, we'll start off chapter four, and then part two or part three will be general insurance and other things, okay? But chapter four, we're going to talk about taxes retirement and other insurance concepts. Why are we talking about taxes, retirement and other insurance concepts? Because life insurance has tax implications. You, know? uh, you also got to learn about retirement, social security, uh, all of those things and other insurance concepts. So I'm going to go through and, and here's my suggestion to you. Try and take the exam along with me. So get a sheet of paper, get a pen, and you write down the question number and and go along with me and guess what the correct answer is. So if you think the answer is A, then you write 51A. Then as I show you the answer, you can be able to see for yourself whether it's you are right or wrong. So this is a good way to kind of gauge how prepared you are for the exam. So you can see, okay, if you're scoring you know, 80% or higher, it tells you that you're, you have to prepare for the exam. If you're scoring 50% or less, it tells you that you need to 
uh, you know, you need to put in more time to study. So don't just watch, but be an active uh, participant. Get a pen and paper. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can pause the video right now. If you're uh, listening to it, you can pause. Uh, if you're listening to this on the podcast, you can pause your the audio, go and get a, uh, a, a pen and paper or a notebook and just take the quiz along with me, okay? So question number 51, it says here, very easy, it says, how many years must a person be insured in order to be qualified to convert a terminated group life insurance policy? Uh, let me see here, just one. Um, all right, now I, I'm gonna repeat that question. So how many years must a person be insured in order to be qualified to convert a terminated group life insurance policy to an individual policy of the same um, coverage. Now, on your exam, you want to take your time and read the question because the mistake a lot of people make, and I even made that mistake <laughs> quite a few times. I'll read and I no, I'll just read it once, or I'll just I won't even read the entire question, right? And I'll think I know the answer. So take your time, read the question. If you need to read it. One more time, that is fine. Now, just another thing to um, warn you guys about. When you start the exam, the exam goes something like this, you know, like a curve, right? You no, know, I don't know how you put it. Uh, uh, you know, like a curve, right? So when the exam starts, the first maybe 20 to 30 minutes of the exam will be very easy questions. Then as the exam progresses, it gets more and more difficult. Then towards the end of the exam, it gets easier and easier and easier. Again, that comes to time management. So when you start the exam, again, the first 20 to 15 um, questions will be a piece of cake. You know, there'll be simple questions that you can just read, boom, answer, right? So those questions, again, you can do them in 45 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, 45 seconds, 30 seconds. As you progress, the questions will get more and more difficult. Halfway through, the questions will be very, very difficult. That is when you get your K-shaped questions. Again, we'll, we'll cover some K-shaped questions in, in other videos um, going forward. But that's where you get your K-shaped questions and you get the very challenging questions. Again, when you get those questions, do not spend more than one minute because the goal is to finish the exam and still have at least 10 to 15 minutes left on the clock to be able to go back and review. So if you don't know the answer, guess it, but mark it for review and then come back to it later, okay? So let's read this question one more time. How many years must a person be insured in order to qualify or in order to be qualified to convert a terminated group life insurance policy to an individual policy of same coverage. One, uh, option choice, A, one, B, five, C, three, and D, 10. What do you think the answer is? Okay, so when, when it says the, um, the coverage is terminated, keep in mind, for group life insurance, the, the employer who is the plan sponsor has the master contract. They own, they are the policy holders, they own the insurance. Everyone else in the group, all of the employees who are on um, that group insurance, all of them get a certificate of completion, okay? So again, the employer gets the master contract because they are the master, okay? The, the employees get the certificate of insurance. Now, if the employer or the group sponsor in this case terminates the group insurance 
Okay, so you are not the one terminating the group insurance. Your employer is the one terminating it. If they terminate it, in order for you, the employee, to be able to convert that policy to an individual insurance policy, you have to wait. No, no, you must have been on that policy, uh, the, uh, part of that group insurance for at least five years. If it's less than five years, you will not be allowed or you will not have that right to convert it to an individual policy. That is if the insurer, uh, that is if the, either the insurer or the employer, which is the uh, group sponsor, if they cancel the policy and then if they cancel it, that is the master contract, it is terminated. So let's click here, the correct answer here would be B, that's five years, have to wait five years. So come here, click answer key, five years. Let's read the explanation. It says individuals who have been on the master contract, again, the employer owns the master contract, they hold the master contract, okay? Individuals who have been on the master contract for five years qualify to convert to an individual policy of same coverage upon termination of the master contract. Okay, so it doesn't mean you are terminated. You can still be with your company, but your company decides, oh, you know what, um, guys, we're sorry, we're no longer offering uh, any group insurance or we're no longer offering any type of um, insurance. If they do that, in order for you to convert that same policy to an individual um, policy, you must have been on that group policy for at least five years. Now, key points about group life insurance. This is just extra. Number one, group life insurance is usually written as an annually renewable term insurance. You're gonna see this probably on your exam. They may ask you, group life insurance is usually written as A, um, annually renewable term, B, whole life, C, something else. Just know that group life insurance is always written as an annually renewable term insurance. I don't know why my mouth is getting so dry. Excuse me, guys. Let me swallow my spit. All right. So... The second thing is that participants do not receive a policy. That's what I said earlier, right? The, the, the group members do not receive a policy. Instead, they receive a certificate of insurance. Again, this will probably be on your exam. It has a 50% chance. No, well, actually, if you're in Washington, DC, you saw this was on your exam outline, right? So you know definitely it's gonna be on your exam. So group participants receive a certificate of insurance. The group sponsor in this case, most of the time is the employer receives the master because they are the master and everybody else is there. They receive the master contract. Everyone else just gets a piece of certificate to show that yes, um, I have insurance with American Airlines, or I have insurance with whoever your employer is. Number three, evidence of insurability is not required if participants enroll within the enrollment period. So, so the, the benefit of group insurance is you don't have to go through underwriting. You don't have to submit an individual uh, uh, application, like in the case of group life insurance, you don't have to go and do a medical exam, all of that stuff, no, okay? There is no evidence of insurability required. That is the difference. With, with individual life insurance policy, evidence of insurability is required. For group life insurance policy, evidence of insurability is not required. Fourth point, the sponsor, as I said earlier, which is usually the employer receives the master contract. Another name for contract is policy. So they'll use them interchangeably. Um, contract, same as policy. Underwriting is based on the group, not the individual. Okay, so underwriting is based on the group, 
not the individual. For example, if it's a group insurance for a group of police officers, so they take into account the occupation of the group, you know, they, uh, you know, they take into account the average age of the group, all of that. So for example, if it's a group of police officers, because all of us know that being a police officer is a more dangerous profession than say being a nurse. So if it's a group insurance for, uh, uh, for police officers, you know the premiums will be a lot higher than a group uh, life insurance for nurses, okay? So the, the underwriting, the premium is based on the group, not the individual. And one of the three things to look at is the occupation of the group, okay? Then number six, the, the employee has 31 days to convert your group insurance to individual insurance after receiving your employer no, after leaving your employer or group. So let's say if someone, no, if you get fired or if you if you quit your job, then you have 31 days, not 30. Be careful. On the exam, they're going to give you options. It's, it's very tricky. <laughs> they'll give, they'll say 30 days, 31 days, then they'll throw 45 days and maybe 10 days. No, 10 days is the free look period. Okay, but 30 days and 31 days is the time you have to convert a group insurance. Okay, this applies to both life and health insurance. You have 31 days, not 30 on the exam. You're gonna see it gets very tricky. You have 31 days to convert a group insurance policy to an individual policy after you leave your employer. All right, so Guys, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can leave your comment uh, in the comment section. Just let me know what you think about these questions so far. Uh, what's, your, what's your thoughts? Uh, do, you, do you think uh, there are good questions to help you prepare? I would like to hear from you. Let's come here to question 52. So question 52, Question 52 says, upon um, termination of a group life plan, which insured employees will qualify for an individual insurance with same coverage conversion or with similar coverage conversion? Okay. Uh, as with, with same coverage conversion. Okay. So it gives you uh, options, right? Again, um, again, it says here, um, let's come here. All right, it says here, uh, option A, employees who have been in, uh, insured under the plan for at least five years, those who have worked in a company for at least three years, employees with dependents, those who have no history of claims. As we just said, just the previous question, question 51, the correct answer is A, employees who have been insured under the plan for at least five years. Let's come here and read the feedback. So the feedback says here, when the master plan or master contract is terminated or employment is terminated, employees who have been under the group plan for five years can easily convert to an individual policy with the same coverage. Note, an employee or group member who leaves the job has 31 days. Again, this is very key. There, in the exam, you're gonna have questions for a number of days, right? For example, you can have a temporary insurance issued for up to 180 days. You have 10 days for your free look period. Uh, if you change your address um, or change your name, you have 30 days. So these, you know, these number of days, you want to get them down pat because it can be very easy if you know them, but it can also be very tricky if you don't know. So get your days down pat. So an employee or group member who leaves your job has 31 days to convert your group 
life insurance to an individual policy. However, if the group sponsor terminates a group policy, AKA master plan, okay, you have to know these synonyms. Um, policy is the same as um, plan or contract, okay? Producer is the same as agent. Insurer is the same as insurance company, all right? Um, so you just you just have to know this. It, it, it kind of makes your job yeah, easier. Admitted is the same as um, as authorized. Then it says then the participants employees can only convert if they have been on a group for at least five years. Okay, let's not beat that like a dead horse. Let's move to the next question. Uh, next question here says upon termination of a group life plan, which insured, no, I'm sorry, that's 52. Let's come to question 53. A parent is buying a life insurance policy on a child. The parent is the policy holder. Which insurance agreement below will be appropriate? Again, a parent is buying a life insurance policy on a child. So in that case, you know the child is going to be the insured, the parent is going to be the applicant and the owner, okay? It says which insurance agreement below will be appropriate? Which insurance agreement? A is third party ownership. What is third party ownership? Third party ownership is anytime you have someone other than the insurer owning the policy. So anytime you have anyone other than the person whose life, in the case of life insurance, is being insured, that is considered a third party ownership, okay? So you're gonna find third party ownership, for example, with um, business insurance, partial agreements, um, executive bonus plans, key person insurance, insurance for minors, okay, because kids, under the age of 18 cannot legally enter into any contract, let alone an insurance contract. So you know that um, that is considered third party. So the correct answer here is A. But let's let's come down here to B, B family term rider, uh, C is basial agreement, and D is an irrevocable beneficiary. An irrevocable beneficiary is just what the name says, right? It's a beneficiary that you cannot remove from your policy unless you get uh, written uh, permission from them. So the correct answer here will be third party ownership. Let's read the explanation and see what it is. It says, when the insured is not the owner of the contract, it can be termed as a third party ownership. This is mostly used for businesses for business or minor children where employer or parents are the policy owner. So just know, anytime someone other than the insured owns the policy is considered third party ownership, all right? So another key point, the insurance contract is always between the policy owner and the insured, even in the case of third party ownership. So the parties to the insurance contract are the policy holder, which 100% of the time is the applicant or 99.9% of the time is the applicant. The policy holder, another name for policy holder is policy owner or contract owner, all means the same. So the contractual agreement is between the policy owner and the insurance company. The insured is not a party to the contract. The insured is a signatory to the contract. That means they have to sign the life insurance application, but they are not a party to the contract. The only people who are party to that contract are the insurance company and the policy holder, okay? So the insurance contract is always between the policy owner and the insurer, even in the case of third party ownership. 
the signatories to the insurance contract. So on your exam, if they ask you who are the signatories to an insurance contract, that's different. The signatories, that means people who have to sign off an insurance contract will be the policy owner, the applicant, again, nine out of 10 times will be the same as the policy owner, the producer, which is just another name for agent, the insurer, if the insured is different from the applicant or the policy owner and the insurance company. So you have four signatories to an insurance contract, the policy owner slash applicant, the producer, who another name for agent, the insured and the insurer. But the parties to an insurance contract are the, um, policy owner or applicant and the insurance company. On the exam, watch out for this. It will appear on your exam. It will say, who are the parties to an insurance contract? And it's gonna give you options, um, um, you know, insured, um, agent, insurer. You know, it's, it's gonna give you different option choices. Uh, A could be uh, insurer and policy owner, B, insurer, agent, and policy owner, C, insurer, agent, insured, and policy owner. Watch out. If it's parties, you know, there can only be two parties. If it's signatories, you can have three or four. All right. So we're, we're done with that. Let's move here to the next, um, let's, let's move here to the next question. All right, uh, let's see here. All right, so now we're on question number 54. It says, the following characteristics are associated with group life insurance except. So which one of the following characteristics is not associated with group life insurance is, says, converting policy to an individual policy without evidence of insurability by the certificate order. B, individuals covered under the policy receive a certificate of insurance. C, Non-discriminatory rules are used to determine the amount of coverage. D, age, sex, and occupation of each employee are used by the certificate order to determine premiums. Okay, so what is the correct answer here? The correct answer, again, we're looking for the wrong answer, so A, says converting policies to an individual policy without evidence of insurability by the certificate holder. Yes, we know that is correct. So that cannot be the answer because we're looking for what is not associated with group life insurance. So group life insurance, we know you can convert a policy, um, a group policy to an individual policy. The benefit is you don't have to show any evidence of insurability you can convert it within 31 days. So we know that. Option two, uh, which is B, says individuals covered under the policy, which is the group policy receive a certificate of insurance. We talked about that earlier. So we know that is correct. C, it says non-discriminatory rules are used to determine the amount of coverage. So for example, they may say, you know what? Insurance for everybody, like um, one of my jobs I had, they say, it was group life insurance. Uh, everybody automatically gets a death benefit um, of 1.5 um, times your, your annual salary. So if your annual salary is 50,000, uh, or let's make it easy. Your annual salary is 100,000. So your death benefit will automatically be, um, you know, um, 100 um, times 1.5, which would be 150,000. 
Okay. Again, synonyms here on the exam, they won't ask you definitions directly. They won't ask you what is a death benefit or what is a face amount, but you just have to know all of them mean the same. So a death benefit means the same, uh, it's the same thing as face amount. So you're going to see face amount, just know it's the same as death benefit. So D, it says age, sex, and occupation of each. The key word here is each of each employee are used by the certificate holder to determine premiums. First of all, we know the certificate holder is the person covered under the group life insurance. So how can the person who's been covered determine the premium? It's the insurance company that determines the premium. So we know that that is hint number one that is false. But hint number two, it says age, sex, and occupation of each employee no, because we know it's not based on each individual employee, it's based on the group. So they take the average age of the group, for example, or they take the ratio of men to women. So we all know, especially for life insurance, women get charged lower premium on average than men. Why? Because they figure out is, you know, again, these are facts women on average tend to live longer than men. So women will always, you know, with all things being equal, women will always pay lower for insurance than men. The same thing we know from, from research that the older you are, the more likely you are to die. So for life insurance, you no, know, on average, but again, with all things being equal, you know, the older you are, the higher your premium will be because the more of a risk you are to the insurance company, okay? So, but they do all of this on a group basis. So they, they take the combined age of everyone and then they average that out, okay? And if that average age is, let's say 50 versus an average age of 40, the group that has an average age of 50 will pay more in premiums than the group that has an average age of 40 or average age of 25. But it's based on a, um, that is done on a group basis, not on an individual basis. So we know here the uh, correct answer is D because we're looking for what is not associated with group life insurance, okay? So we'll come here, let's read the explanation. It says age, sex, and occupation of each member of the group are, you know, um, are not factors, okay, to determine premium. So um, let's, let's, let's go here a little deeper. It says premiums are determined by the average age of the group, the sex and occupation of the entire group, not just the individual. For example, premiums for a group of doctors will be lower than premiums for a group of police officers because poli uh, policing is generally a more dangerous profession than being a medical doctor. To decrease the risks of adverse selection, the insurance company offering the group insurance policy will usually require a minimum number of participants for the group. So for example, they'll require if it is minimum 75% of the group members have to um, um, uh, be participants of the group, all right? So now we got that out of the way. Now let's go to the next question. Our next question is, Here, why wow, this is uh, all right. Uh, so, our next question is question number 55, and it says here the owner and beneficiary on a key person life insurance policy can be referred to as whom? So, who is both the owner? and beneficiary on a key person life insurance. First of all, you have to know what is a key person life insurance. Now, for life insurance, you have business uses of life insurance and you have personal uses of life insurance. So what are the business uses of life insurance? We have key person um, insurance. So you have a key person in the business, most of the time it's a senior executive. That person is key to the business. So if something happens to that person, 
the business will suffer a financial loss because the, the loss, uh, you know, those skills and it will take time to find someone uh, of the same training, you not know, to hire that person. It will take money to hire and train and all of that. So insurance companies will get um, insurance on your key persons. So in that case, the, ins uh, the employer, all right, or the business would be the owner of the policy. They will be the beneficiary, but that key person would be the insured. So God forbid, if that key person dies, then the business will get that payout to find a replacement, to train and hire you know, a replacement, all right? The other use, the other business use of life insurance is something called executive bonus plan. And the other one is buy sell agreement. Again, we're going to talk more about that later on. So what are the answer choices here? It says the employer, the key employee is the owner and, and employer, and the employer is the beneficiary. C says the key employee. D says the employer is the owner and the key employee is the beneficiary. But as I just said, the correct answer is going to be A is the employer. Okay, let's come here to the explanation. It says the business, which is usually the employer, is the applicant, owner, premium payer, so they pay the premium, and beneficiary in the key person coverage. So let's talk here more about key person insurance. Again, the employee is the insured with an ED, insured. The premium is not taxable. So the premium the, uh, the business is paying for that key person insurance is not taxable. But when the business receives the death benefit, the business receives the death, death benefit tax free. Another thing to keep in mind is that all death benefits, all insurance death benefits are received tax free. So that is something you should know, hands down. Uh, that will be on your exam in some, uh, no, in some shape, you know, um, it's gonna be on your exam. Know that insurance death benefit proceeds are always, without exception, always receive tax-free. It doesn't matter if it's a business receiving that death benefit or if it's an individual. As long as uh, it's an insurance death benefit, is going to be received income tax free. All right, we are making progress, guys. Let's come here to next question. Question 56. It says in a contributory group plan, what is the required number of group? Um, what is what is the required number of group plan participants, okay? What is the required number of group plan participants? Uh, A says 20%, B, 69%, C, 100%, D, 75%. Now, there are two types of group insurance. We have non contributory group plans. That means the insurance company is paying all of the premium, 100% of the premium, and the employees do not have to pay anything. Or you have contributory group plans. That means the, um, the em employees pay a certain percentage or pay a certain portion of the premiums. Now, in, in order for it to be considered contributory plan, at least 75% of the employees or 75% of eligible employees, okay, need to sign up for that plan, need to participate. And it's the employer that will determine what the eligibility um, requirements are. For example, some employers will say, oh, you know what, you have to work full time for at least 90 days in order to be eligible for group insurance. 
Some may say six months, some may say one year, but it's the insurer that sets the eligibility requirement. So for, for the insurance company, all the insurance company cares about is 75%, at least 75% of eligible um, employees have to enroll in that plan in order for it to be a contributory group plan. So the correct answer is D. But let's read our explanation and see what it says, okay? Um, uh, let's see. So here, explanation, it says, an insured, you know, an insurer will require that 75% in a contributory group plan of eligible employees be included in the plan. Okay, so keep in mind that contributory means employees are paying a portion of the premium, maybe 10%, 20%, but employee, I'm sorry, employees are paying a portion of the premium. So both, both the employer and employees <laughs> are responsible for paying the premium. But non-contributory, it means the employer pays all, pays 100% of the premium. All right. So if you know these key things about group life insurance, because you're going to get about maybe two or three questions on group insurance. So these things we're covering, that's it, guys. That's all you need to know about group life insurance. Know what is the difference between, uh, uh, you know, what are the two types? What are the requirements for each type? Um, what is the requirement for you to be able to um, convert? You have to convert within 31 days and all of that. Um, that is it for our group. No, um, you don't need to know much else after that. All right. So now let's come to question number 57. It says to obtain a fully insured status for social security disability benefits, what is the required number of credits? Now, on the exam, for a lot of people, even including me, you know, the tax portion of the exam, social security, Medicare, and the tax portion, that's the most difficult and most confusing part for a lot of people. Rule of thumb, anything that has to do with taxes, most of the time is confusing. I don't know why it has to be so complicated, but that's just how it is. So for social security disability, right? What is the required number of credits? First of all, you have to know what is credits, right? So credit is what they use to determine your social security um, um, benefits eligibility. So if you earn 40 credits, then you're considered fully insured. That means you're entitled to all of the social security benefits, including Medicare and yada, 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 okay? Now, you can earn, just think about, um, you can earn, you can earn um, three, you can earn, okay. So one credit is equal to three months of work or it's considered one, one quarter of work. So every year you can earn, if you're working throughout the year, you can earn four quarters every year, okay? So three months of work equals one credit. So two, uh, six months of work will be equals what? Two credits. And nine months of work will be equals to three credits and 12 months of work will be equals to four credits. So each year, the maximum number of credits you can earn towards your social security um, disability benefits or your social security benefits is four credits. Now, in order to be fully insured, you have to uh, work, you have to earn at least 40. So let's, let's read the option choices here. So it's, so obtain a full insured status of social security benefits, what is the required number of credits? 40, 25, 30, and six. Well, the correct answer is 40. 
six, you need to have to earn six credits in the last 13 quarters in order to be considered currently or partially insured. So you'll be entitled to some partial um, uh, benefits like um, survival, uh, no, like so, um, social security survival benefits. Let's go here to our explanation. All right. So it says a person is referred to as fully insured when they have earned 40 quarters of coverage. Fully insured people are entitled to social security, uh, retirement, Medicare, and survival benefits. More on social security. Note that social security is also called old age survivors disability insurance. Okay, that's another name for it. So guys, on the exam, you got to know these synonyms because they may not ask you directly how many uh, credits do you need to be uh, fully insured uh, under social security. They may say, how many credits do you need to be insured under the, um, the old age survivor's disability insurance. And you're telling yourself, what? what is old age survivor's disability insurance? It's social security, okay? So next thing is keep in mind that social security is a federal program. So social security is run by the federal government. Medicare is run by the federal government. Whereas Medicaid is run by the state government. Well, technically it's a state and federal joint um, you know, partnership, but, but the state governments usually run it. Then the third thing on social security is to know that you can earn, as I said earlier, a max of four credits per year. So one credit is equal to three months of work. So you can earn four credits maximum every year. So 40 quarters would just be equal to 10 years. 10 years of work, okay? Because you divide 40 quarters um, by 40 quarters per year, that gives you 10. So if you work 10 years straight, nonstop, without any interruptions, you are fully insured for social security. Number five, currently or partially insured. So in order to be considered currently or partially insured, and that will entitle you to partial social security uh, benefits, you have to earn at least six credits. That means you have to work at least six months. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, you have to work at least a year and a half, okay? Because four credits in a year, uh, two credits in six months. So at least a year and a half in the last 13 quarters, okay? And you're, when you're partially insured or currently insured, you are entitled to receive certain benefits like survival benefits. All right. And guys, I hope you are still writing all of this down. You have your pen and paper, you're you know, seeing what's your progress so far. We've done a thing about six or seven questions so far. I mean, have you scored, have you passed all six or seven? So you can be able to gauge yourself. All right, let's come here. Question 58. It says from the options below, select the internal revenue code that provides for an individual retirement plan for public school teachers. Option A says KIA, that's K-E-O-G-H. -E I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, KIA or KO, I don't know. B says 403B plan TSA. TSA stands for tax sheltered annuities. Then C says solo 401k and um, um, S uh, or SEP. Okay. And then um, D says IRA. IRA stands for individual retirement account. So which one of these? is specifically for um, public school teachers. The correct answer, if you guessed B, you guessed right. The correct answer is B, 403B plan um, TSA, all right? Let's come here to the uh, answer choices. Let's come to the explanation. 
So it says 403B tax shelter annuities, okay, um, just abbreviated TSA, may be created for employees of nonprofits, 503C organizations. Again, 503C uh, is the section of the Internal Revenue Code that allows for nonprofit organizations. So 503Cs are nonprofit organizations that do not have to pay taxes. What are some examples of 5013C organizations? They are educational um, institutions, you know, um, nonprofit educational institutions like public schools, teachers in public schools, religious organizations, charitable organizations. Let's talk more about um, the 43B TSA program. So these plans are usually not available to other kinds of employees. These are just for non profit employees. So whether you are an employee of a religious institution for, for teachers, uh, you know, public school teachers, all of that. But it's just for uh, 503C um, kind of um, you know, um, employees. Only nonprofit organizations are eligible. So if you are with a for, you know, for profit corporation or company or business, you are not eligible. And the employer, both the employer and the employee contribute to the plan, similar to let's say a 401k or stuff where your employer puts a, a, a certain percentage, you know, matches a certain percentage. All right, we are making progress. Question 59. It says the following are associated with the business uses of life insurance, except remember we talked about business uses of life insurance not too long ago. So A says buy sell agreements. B says executive um, bonus plans. C says funding against companies general financial loss. D key person insurance. So which of the following are not associated with the business uses of life insurance? Okay, which of the following is not associated with the business uses of life insurance? It's a buy sell agreement. Well, we know buy sell agreement is a business use of life insurance. We know executive bonus plan um, is a business use of life insurance. We know key person insurance is a business use of life insurance. So the correct answer, the one that is not associated with business use of life insurance is funding against companies general financial loss, okay? So you cannot use life insurance just to fund against your companies. The key word is general financial loss. Now, if it's lost due to a key employee or business partner, that's different, but just general company's financial loss. So the correct answer is, is going to be C because we know C is wrong. So let's come here to our explanation. It says businesses can use life insurance to compensate their executives or owners using executive bonus plan. They can fund the business in case one of the owners dies with buy sell agreements. They can pay to replace and continue the business after the premature death of key employees with key employee insurance. All right, we're moving along. Question 60. We have about roughly 30 more questions to go because we're gonna stop around um, question 91. So question 60. And, and let me just say guys, um, this is for the Washington DC or District of Columbia life insurance exam. But if you are still, if you're in another state, you can still benefit, okay? About 50% of this is general, 50 to 60% is general insurance knowledge. So it's not specific to Washington DC. <laughs> Excuse me, ah, my, my mouth keeps getting dry. Excuse me, let me take a sip of water. So if you want to, if you, well, if you like what you're learning so far, Again, this is just a sample thing about this. Uh, think of this as more like an appetizer. So if you go to a restaurant, uh, you have an appetizer. Well, that is if you, you know, that is if you go to a good restaurant, okay? 
<laughs> if you go to McDonald's, there is no appetizer at McDonald's. But if you go to a you know, nice sit-down restaurant, you're going to have an appetizer. And the appetizer is kind of preparing you for the main dish. So think about this as an appetizer. I'm just sharing you know, a few questions. When you enroll in our course, you have access to 500, uh, well, depending on what plan you select, you could have access to 500, 750, even up to a thousand of these kinds of questions. So now if you go over a thousand of these kinds of questions, a thousand questions, it's almost impossible for you to fill your exam. The reason I say almost impossible is unless you go, unless you're like me, I said a few minutes ago, like I only got two hours of sleep and I, when I experience a brain freeze, right? So unless you don't sleep and you go and you have a brain freeze or unless you fall asleep um, in the testing center. But if you do a thousand questions, it is almost impossible for you to fail. And if you like what you're learning so far, again, this is just a sample of some of the questions we have, just a sample. Uh, part one and part two will total maybe 100, 150 questions. It's just a sample. We have hundreds, even more than a thousand questions that you can use. So if you like what you're learning so far, click the uh, link, the survey link. You can put all your information. It will take you, my guess is not more than 10 minutes, you know, probably say five minutes to fill that out. And then we can uh, have you on our list so now when we create a course for your state, we can email and notify you, all right? So uh, let's get back to our study. So question 60, it says, with a balance of 750,000 in her qualified plan, Chioma, a surgeon, decided to quit her job. How much will be transferred from one plan administrator to another, and what is the tax consequence of a direct transfer if she decides to do a direct transfer from her plan to a traditional IRA? A, say 750,000, no tax. B, 600,000, uh, comma, 100,000 tax on only the growth. C says 750,000, 300 tax on both principal and growth. And D says 70, no, 75,000, no tax. What is the correct answer? So the key for these kinds of questions, they're going to have fillers. <laughs> and <clears throat> what I mean by filler is those are things that are just there to take up space. They don't, they're not really essential to answering the question. And you wanna see on the exam, you're gonna have some very long questions. Some of them will be three or four sentences long. When you have those kinds of questions, what you wanna do is get rid of the fillers because the fillers sometimes will be there to throw you off. So in this case, what are some fillers we have here? It says, um, um, Chioma, well, first of all, we don't care who she is, okay? We don't care whether she's a surgeon or whether she's an Uber driver. We don't give a damn, all right? So Chioma, she's a surgeon. She decided to quit her job. We don't care whether she decided to quit her job. We don't care about that, okay? So those are fillers. So you can take that one sentence out. That is filler, okay? That would just help to distract you. Yeah, it says how much will she transfer, you know, how much will be transferred from one plan administrator to another? And what is the tax consequence of a direct transfer if she decides to do a direct transfer from her plan to a traditional IRA? So that's all you need to need. So what is the correct answer? We know that anytime you're doing a direct transfer from one qualified plan to another qualified plan, there is no tax consequence. There is no tax penalty. 
So as long as that money doesn't um, come in, you know, doesn't go into your personal account, right? You know, you take the money from, let's say you work with ABC company, right? So you transfer that money, you roll that money over from ABC company to, um, you know, to uh, Mr. Smith's company, right? Once that money is rolled over and that money doesn't come into your account, you don't have access to it, doesn't come to you. If they roll that money over within 60 days, okay, you know, again, these are some numbers I was telling you guys about days and stuff. So for rollovers, it has to be done within 60 days in, you know, 60 days in order for you not to pay any penalty or pay any tax. If it's greater than 60 days or if that money, if you got, if you keep that money in your account, um, that money comes to you. Again, if you hold that money in your account for more than 60 days, you know, or if you withdraw it, you get taxed, okay? But 60 days is when is the deadline, is the maximum time it can take to transfer from one, okay? Again, transfer is the same as rollover, okay? To transfer your 401k or your retirement um, assets, you know, your qualified retirement assets, okay, from one retirement account to another one, 60 days. So let's come here to the explanation. So the, so the correct answer would be um, A, which is 750,000 no tax, because why? She has a qualified plan. A qualified plan is simply a plan that has been approved by the IRS. So for example, 401ks are approved plans by the IRS. Um, IRAs, which are in, um, individual retirement accounts, those are qualified plans. Rough IRAs are qualified plans. So as long as it moves from one qualified plan to another qualified plan within 60 days, without you touching that money, you don't pay, you don't pay a penny in taxes. There is no, um, there is no penalty. You get 100% of your money transferred over. So let's come here to the explanation. So the explanation here says, right? Uh, explanation here, it says, anytime there is a direct transfer, also called rollover, from one qualified retirement plan to another qualified plan, the full amount goes into the new plan with zero tax. Let's talk more about IRA rollovers and just IRAs in general. Number one, IRA stands for individual retirement account. Two, rollover must be completed, as I said earlier, within 50, no, 60 days in order to avoid paying tax. Three, if the, IRA, if, if the IRA owner withdraws the money instead of rolling it over, the trustee, so the, so the trustee is the, is the company that controls the IRA, right? So most employers will have a separate trustee for their retirement accounts or the employer in retirement account. For example, for one of my previous jobs, the trustee of their uh, 401k plan was Transamerica. So Transamerica handle everything, right? So the trustee of the IRA must withhold 20% of the funds. So just a little joke aside, uh, one of my aunties, she you no, know, she withdrew <laughs> a lot of money from her 401k. And it, it, I think she withdrew almost 20,000, yeah, about 20,000. But she got pissed off that the people withheld some money. So she called me because in my family, I'm known as this financial professional. <laughs> so she called me. She's so upset, like, oh, you no, know, I, I really need that, that 20,000. And, you know, and I called the and I, and I call those people and they will tell me that they have to withhold some of my money. No, I don't want them to withhold it. I, I'm, I'm gonna worry about the IRS later. And I just told her, well, I'm sorry, by law, they have to withhold 20% for tax purposes. That is a law, they have to withhold 20%. Now with the 10% tax penalty, assuming you're under the age of 59 and a half, you can uh, pay that penalty when you go to file your tax. But 20%, at least the trustee of the plan must withhold 20% of that money. Number four, 
IRA is a qualified retirement plan. So what you got to know is you want, you want to know what are all the, the qualified retirement plans. As I, I gave you guys an example of 401ks, IRAs, Roth IRAs, um, um, those you know, um, 43Bs, those are all qualified tax retirement plans. Number five, qualified retirement plans, it just means that it's approved by the IRS. And six, anyone with earned income is eligible for an IRA, right? So anyone who is working for money, so you can be, um, you know, you can have your own business where you're earning money from your business, or you can be an employee, you're eligible to, uh, to create, or you're, you're eligible to open an IRA. Now, if you are earning passive income, okay, that is not earned income. Like let's let's say if I'm a millionaire, and and I no and I'm getting no, I'm not really working for any money. I'm not doing getting money from my business, but I'm but I'm earning no, I'm getting money through dividends, through passive income, right? Every three months, uh, I'm, I'm getting five or twenty thousand in dividends. Because that is not earned income, that is ineligible for, uh, no, you're, no, you're ineligible to um, open an IRA. All right, let's go. Now we are, we are to the next chapter, that's chapter five. So as I said earlier, on the exam, you have two parts. You have the general insurance part, and you have the state insurance portion. So for, the, for most states, the average, the state insurance portion will range roughly, you know, weighted you know, between 25% um, on the low end up to 35% of your exam, all right? So, so a lot of people just study the general portion, but they don't really, um, pay attention to the state portion of the exam. But that is a huge mistake because at least 25% of the exam will come from uh, state regulations. So chapter five is just uh, Washington DC laws and rules and regulations for all lines. So this is pertaining to all insurance, not just life insurance. So under the state regulations, you have two parts. You have the general, uh, you no, know, the state insurance laws that apply to all insurance. Then the other one, you're going to have the state laws that apply to just that specific line of insurance you're uh, applying for or you want to get licensing. So like if it's life insurance, you have, um, you know, a certain part would just be on life insurance, but certain, the other part would be on all insurance. So for those of you who are not, I'm um, going to take the Washington DC uh, life insurance exam. You can feel free to drop off at this point because this is just Washington DC laws. So, I mean, you can still watch, you can still listen, but it really won't do you that much favor because every state has different insurance laws. So I was telling you guys uh, not too long ago about the different parts of the state law, right? So for example, here, uh, on the, okay, so, so Washington DC, on your test, you're gonna have a total of 95 questions for the life insurance exam. And out of those 95 questions, 35% of them, uh, no, that's a, um, about, yeah. So 35 of those will be on state regulations. Out of those 35, 20 will be on general insurance laws for the state and and another um and another 10 another 10 uh another 10 will be on just laws specifically for life insurance all right so let's get back here to our uh to our study so question 61, it says the person responsible for paying the fee for an insurance producer's appointment is known as whom? A, 
the Insurance Guarantee Association, B, the appointing insurer, C, the insurance producer, D, the Department of Insurance. So who is responsible for paying the producer's appointment fee? Now, when you get your license, before you can work with any insurance company, that insurance company has to appoint you. So they have to sign a, a contract with you to say, okay, you know what, um, David is gonna work with us or he's gonna work for us. So he's our, he's our you know, agent. So now you guys form an agency uh, relationship. So you are an agent for that insurance company, but the insurance company has to notify the state. You know, they have to, even though you guys signed that contract, but they have to go and inform the state like, hey, David, we've appointed David to be our agent, all right? So now the question is asking, who is responsible for paying that fee? Because anytime you're interacting with the State Department of Insurance, money has to change hands most of the time. <laughs> if you want to apply for a new license, you have to pay them money. If you want to renew your license, you have to pay them money. If you, I mean, this is just my experience. A lot of things you want to do will require you paying some kind of fee to the um, uh, insurance department. So in this case, the insurance company that you are getting appointed with is responsible for paying your appointment fee. Not you, the agent, no. And by the way, what is the National uh, Insurance Guarantee Association? That is an association put in place to protect policyholders and beneficiaries from um, you know, financial insolvency of an insurance company. The same way for those of you who have a bank account, there's something that protects each, um, each and everyone who has a bank account. That's called the Federal Depository Insurance Corporation, where they insure your money up to 250,000. That's why you don't have to worry, God forbid, if your bank files for bankruptcy, you know that your money is protected up to 250,000. So similar, so they have that for banks. So the equivalent for insurance companies will be the Insurance Guarantee Association. Every state has it. And one of the requirements for you to become um, an authorized insurance um, company in a state is to be a part of that association. So that association protects the public uh, from financial insolvency of an insurance company. So if the insurance company goes bankrupt um, or for some reason it falls off the face of the earth tomorrow and you can't get a hold of anybody, that um, association will step in just like the FDIC, they're going to step in to, uh, not, not to reimburse people. Now, for the state of DC, I keep calling DC a state. Um, for all intents and purposes, DC should be a state. Um, this is just me going off on a tangent here because there is no reason why DC should not be a state. I mean, we have 600 plus thousand or I think up to 800,000 people live in DC, some smaller states that have fewer people, um, you know, smaller population than DC, there are states, but DC is more populated than Wyoming and some other states, but yet and still we don't have statehood. But anyway, that is me as a DC resident advocating for statehood. So please don't be mad at me. So, but for DC, the Insurance Guarantee Association will guarantee up to 300,000 of your money. So um, whatever, if you pay, let's say $300,000 in premium and God forbid your insurance company goes bankrupt or your CEO and CFO, all of them run away or whatever, or the insurance company, whatever happens, um, then Insurance Guarantee Association will step in and pay you up to $300,000 um, in, in damages or total premium you pay. All right, 
So let's see here what um, is the answer. So it says here, when appointing a producer, it is the insurers, again, insurer is just a fancy name for insurance company. So every industry has lingo. They have their own jargon. They have their own language. So in order to be successful in the exam, you have to become familiar with insurance industry jargon. And I talk more about that. Um, that will be in subsequent videos. You want to learn all the different terminologies uh, in insurance. But these little things, because most of the time on the exam, they're not going to ask you, um, they're not going to say insurance company, they're going to say insurer. But you just have to know that it is insurance company. Most of the time, they won't say agent, but they're going to say producer. You have to know that producer is the same as agent. So those little things, they won't ask you directly um, who is a producer or you know what is an insurer. Um, but they will expect you to know that an insurer is an insurance company. All right, so more on appointments. So the insurance commissioner has 10 days to verify agents' appointment eligibility. Okay, so let's say um, Sarah gets appointed with ABC Insurance Company. ABC Insurance Company sends Sarah's name over to the DC Department of Insurance. By law, the insurance commissioner He's the head of the entire insurance department. Anything that has to do with insurance in the state of Washington, D.C., he is responsible for that, right? So he has 10 days, again, 10 days, not 10 business days. Because on the exam, sometimes they're going to trick you. You know it's 10 days, but they may have two answer choices. They'll say 10 business days, 10, um, no, 10 days. And you're like, oh my God, which one? Is it business days? Is it it's just 10 days. So that's including weekends. So the insurance commissioner has 10 days to verify whether um, Sarah is eligible to be appointed. Then number two, the insurer must file a notice within 30 days from the date that the agent submits his or her application or the agency can't contract goes into effect. So the, the insurance agents, uh, no, the insurance company must submit Sarah's name to the um, Department of Insurance within 30 days of you signing that um, contract agreement with them, that appointment agreement with them, or, or, um, or um, after you submit, your first application, your first client application. So you, so you write your first piece of business. It has to be 30 days from that time, all right? Now, within five days, these are dates you have to know because these are the things that will be tested on the state portion of the exam. So, so the test um, number of days a lot, okay? A lot on the state insurance exam. So these are things you have to, I can guarantee you at least some of them will be on your exam, all right? So within five days of determining that the producer is ineligible for appointment, the commissioner must notify the insurer. So, so let's say the commissioner comes back and say, oh yes, um, ABC um, insurance company, I see that you uh, have Sarah appointed with you, but based on our requirements, she is ineligible um, you know, for appointment. So the, so the commissioner has five days to notify the insurer of that. Then insurers must notify the com, uh, commissioner within 30 days after terminating uh, a producer's appointment. So within 30 days, if let's say you and the insurer decide to part ways, you get fired or you, know, or you quit your job or, you know, or if you're an agent, you leave. Within 30 days, they have to notify the uh, insurance commissioner. So keep in mind, 30 days comes a lot in state laws. You have to notify the insurance commissioner 
within 30 days of changing your name or changing your address, you have to notify, not the insurer has to notify the, not the commissioner within 30 days uh, of, you know, of a new agent coming on board and being appointed of them. They also have to notify the insurer within 30 days after terminating that producer's appointment. So keep in mind all these dates. If I were you, what I'll do is I'll have a chart and I'll have 30 days. On the 30 days, I'll have all the things that must be done within 30 days. Then I'll have 10 days, all the things that must be done within 10 days, then five days, then 180 days, then 60 days, 45 days. It gets a little confusing. When you take our course, uh, you know, we, we have a nice little chart summary you know, that, that kind of puts all of this in a chart format. You know, it makes it very easy to study. But if you're not taking our course, that's something you can do on your own. All right, question 62. It says, regarding a certificate of authority, which of the options below is not true? Again, about 30% of your exam, you no, know, 30% of the questions on the exam will have the word either not true, not correct, except. So these questions are a little, little more tricky than just the straight plain, you know, the straightforward question that will ask you, for example, it may ask you regarding a certificate of um, um, authority, which of the following is true, right? It's very easy. But when it asks you not true, now you have to go and find what is true and then you eliminate the answer choices that are not true. And then the one that is not true will be the uh, right answer. So what are the answer choices here? It says, A, it is only issued to life insurance policy holders in the District of Columbia. B says the, uh, the commissioner has the authority to suspend or revoke a certificate of authority. C says it is issued by the State Department of Insurance. And D says it is equivalent to an insurance license. So what says which of the following options is not true regarding a certificate of authority? First of all, you have to know what is a certificate of authority. So a certificate of authority, it is something that the State Department of Insurance issues an insurer to do business in that state. So it is the equivalent of a license. So what do agents get? What do producers get? So when you pass your license exam and you do your fingerprints and you pay the application fee for Washington DC, your license application fee is $100. So you do your fingerprints and within two weeks, you get your license, right? So the state, Department of Insurance will issue you a license and that license is what gives you the legal right to solicit insurance, to sell insurance and all of that. For insurers, what gives them the right to transact business in a state is a certificate of authority. So the certificate of authority is equivalent to an insurance license. So we know D um, cannot be the answer because D is true. C, it is issued by the State Department of Insurance, that's true. And A, um, no, B says the commissioner has the authority to suspend or revoke a certificate of authority, that's true. No, that is one of his um, uh, job uh, responsibilities. So the, the incorrect answer, which is the correct answer would be A, it is only issued to life insurance policy holders in the District of Columbia. Life insurance policy holders, number one, do not get issued anything by the um, Department of Insurance. But if they get issued anything, right, life insurance policy holders get a policy, not a certificate of authority. So no A is the incorrect answer. Let's look here and see what the explanation is. So it says here, Insurers must be granted a certificate of authority 
that's equivalent to a license from the Department of Insurance before transacting business in the state. In addition, they must satisfy all state required financial requirements, just like uh, as a producer, when you go apply for your license, you have to pay a licensing fee. They too have to pay a licensing fee, all right? So let's talk more about certificate of authority. Number one, the only insurers not required to, um, you know, to obtain a certificate of authority are licensed excess and surplus line brokers. So every, every other insurance company that does business uh, insurance business in a state must be authorized slash admitted and they must have a certificate of authority with the exception of um, you know, um, excess and surplus lines insurers. Now you may ask what is excess and surplus lines insurer? Those are insurers that are not um, admitted, they are not approved to do business in a state, but because of maybe something, maybe there's a natural disaster or, or there's some, there's a need for insurers that goes beyond the, the current number of insurers you have in the state, then the insurance commissioner has emergency powers. Where now he can say, okay, you know what? Yes, we we'll, um, normally require people, you know, insurance companies to be licensed uh, or to, to be approved before they can offer services to our, um, our residents, but because we're going to, well, it's an emergency. So we you know, you know we're going to grant you guys the um, uh, exception to do business. So you're going to find, uh, for example, a good example was, was COVID-19, right? At the height of COVID-19, a lot of states were suspending their licensing requirements for, you know, for healthcare workers. I know, for example, for, for New York, New York said, you know what, as long as you're a nurse, you're a doctor, you're a pharmacist, uh, any healthcare worker, you don't have to be licensed in New York City, will suspend the licensing requirement, just come because this is an emergency, we need as many healthcare workers, come and help us. So they suspended the licensing requirement. So now you could come as a healthcare worker, as long as you are licensed in your home state, you could come and work in New York. And it was not just New York, a lot of other states did it. I know um, um, the state of Maryland did it, District of Columbia did it. A lot of states uh, suspended the licensing requirement. So it's something similar to that, all right? Now, two, insurers with a certificate of authority are also considered admitted or authorized, okay? So that is just another name. So if you're a producer, you're licensed, if you're, um, if you're an insurer, you're admitted or authorized. So on the exam, just know that admitted or authorized is the equivalent of being licensed for an insurer. No, so just know that it gets a little tricky, but all of them mean the same thing. They may use um, authorized, they may use admitted, just know it means the same thing. Three, Unapproved insurers, that, that is insurers that do not have a certificate of authority are considered unauthorized or non admitted So if they're not uh, approved, they're considered unauthorized or non admitted All right, let's go to question 63. It says the Insurance Guarantee Association shares which of the following purpose? Remember, we just talked about this earlier, so you should know the answer to this. So A says, help non-admitted insurers cover liability claims. Now, we just talked about what is non-admitted insurers. Those are um, non-approved insurers, right? Then B, it says, revoke license of District of Columbia insurers. C says, protect beneficiaries and policyholders in case their insurer becomes insolvent. D, shield insurers from criminal liability. Now let's go through the option choices. A, help non-admitted insurers cover liability claims. No, that's not correct. They revoke license of District of Columbia insurers. The only person who has the authority to revoke the license of a District of Columbia insurer is the um, commissioner, okay? The insurance commissioner. 
and D, it says she will insure us from criminal liability. Trust me, if you um, commit any criminal act, whether as, a, as an individual or as a company, no organization can shield you from criminal liability. So we know that is false. So the correct answer in this case would be C, which is it protects beneficiaries and policyholders in case your insurer becomes insolvent. Let's come here to the explanation. Uh, here, it says, according to District of Columbia law, all, all admitted insurers must have membership in the insurance guarantee association. So this is not optional, okay? The insurance guarantee association exists to protect policy owners and beneficiaries against losses caused by insurers who go bankrupt, insolvent, or cannot pay claims. All right. Question 64. In the District of Columbia, a producer license expires when? This I can guarantee you 99.9% .9 will be on the exam. It's almost on every state exam. So you have to know if you're not um, a, a, a DC resident, you have to know this for your state, okay? So in the District of Columbia, a producer license expires A, June 1st of every odd number year, B, December 31st, every even number year, C, every three years on the producer's birth month, D, every two years on the producer's birth month. The correct answer will be D, every two years on the producer's birth month. Let's look here at the explanation. So biannually, biannually on, on the um, birth month, an insurer producer license expires. Now, by, I'm sorry, it should be by, by annual. So B I E N N U A L L. So that means every, uh, no, every two years. So by, by annual means every two years. So on the exam, you may see by, again, um, for those of you watching on YouTube, this is actually a misspell. Uh, it should be by annual. So B I E N A N U A L. Okay. So B I E N U A L. Um, let's see here. So, so when it's, um, all right. So, so by annual is every six months. By annual with an E is every two years. So on your exam, don't let that trick you because they may not say every two years, they may just say by annually. But you know by annual with an E means every two years. So uh, just remember it means the same. All right. So because you gotta know on the exam, these are little, little things. You, you can know the exam material, but if you don't understand these subtle um, differences, it can mean the difference between uh, between passing and filling your exam. All right, other license requirements. The producer license is valid for two years, we know that. Two, producer has one year to reinstate a lapsed license. So a lapsed license means you didn't renew your license on time and it's expired. So they have one year to renew it without uh, having to retake the exam. But keep in mind though, the producer must complete required CEs and pay any required fees. So every time you go to renew your license, you have to pay a license, um, you know, licensing fee, right? And you have to do CE. CE just means continuing education, right? Now the minimum age to get a license um, in the state of um, Washington, DC, is 18 and producers have 30 days to report change of address or name. Again, I said that earlier. Now for DC, every state will have different um, CE requirements. For, for Washington DC, you're required to complete 24 hours of CEs 
every two years. But out of those 24, three of them must be on ethics, all right? This will be on your exam 99 for 9% percent guarantee. You need 24 hours of CEs in BC, and out of the 24 hours, three of them will be on ethics. Number six, a temporary license may be issued for up to 180 days, that's six months. So the ins insurance um, commissioner under extreme circumstance may issue a temporary producer license, but it cannot exceed 180 days. Number seven, producer has 30 days to report any action taken against them. For example, um, if your license in another state is suspended or is revoked or you are, you are convicted of a crime, in Washington, D.C., you have to notify the um, commissioner of insurer within 30 days of finding that out. Again, so, so, so we see here 30 days is, no, is, is coming back a lot. 30 days to report a name change, 30 days to report any action taken against you, um, you know, as, as, uh, as a producer, 30 days for the uh, insurance company to uh, report employment. So, so 30 days comes a lot. So trust me, you're gonna see a question, 100% guarantee, a question on your exam involving the number 30 days, okay? So again, do a little chart or table that divides everything under 30 days. You have all the items that are uh, you know, the 430 days, 10 days, just like that. Uh, that is if you're not taking our course. Okay, question number 65. An unfair claim settlement would be which of the following um, options, okay? First of all, what is unfair claim settlement? So unfair, it just means it's not fair right, and claim settlement. So when you file a claim, the insurance company is supposed to settle your claim, you know? So settling your claim means that you're supposed to pay out your claim or at least you're supposed to do an investigation. Even if they deny your claim, they're supposed to do some type of investigation, all right? So what is an unfair claim settlement um, practice? A, it says not telling be insured anything about arbitration. So if you guys are in a dispute and you have a third party comes to uh, you know, to arbitrate, you know, to uh, settle things. B, requesting the insurer to submit a signed proof of loss after the insurer has verbally, um, all right, uh, that is that is caught up. But after the insurer has verbally um, already informed the uh, insurer. C says failing to confirm or deny coverage of claims within a reasonable time after proof of loss has been submitted. And D says delaying the settlement of a claim for 30 days in order for the insured to conduct an investigation. I know this is uh, these are long answer choices. Again, you can pause the video here, take your time, read over it, and see what the correct answer. But yeah, so it says, which of the following will be an unfair claims practice? Okay, so the answer here will be C, guys. You are failing to confirm or deny coverage of claims within a reasonable time after proof of loss has been submitted. So it's going to have everything in the contract. You no, know? how long do you have to investigate? But you can, um, for example, it can't take you one year for you to you let the, uh, you no, know, let the insured know that you are going to deny um, your claim or you're going to confirm it. Come on, it can't take you one year. So if it takes you one year. So either confirm or deny coverage of a claim that is considered unfair claims practice or on, on unfair claim settlement because it is not reasonable. It is unreasonable. And more than likely that is not even gonna be within the insurance uh, policy. Now, not telling the insured anything about arbitration. Well, if we are in arbitration, 
I don't have to tell you anything about what's going on. So there's nothing unfair about that, right? Requesting the insurer to submit sound proof of law statement after you've verbally told them. Well, even if you call us over the phone, we'll require you to sign some, some paperwork. So that is not unfair. Then D, delaying the settlement of claim for 30 days in order for the insurer to, the insured to conduct their own investigation. There is nothing unfair about that. So the correct answer is C. Now let's read our explanation. It says, um, again, unfair claims settlement practice is one of seven unfair trade practices. Again, um, what are unfair trade practices? Number one is rebating. What is rebating? Rebating is just offering inducement. So, so you're offering some type of inducement. It can be financial inducement, um, you know, in the solicitation or sale of insurance, right? So, so that um, that is uh, unfair trade uh, practice. The second one will be false advertising. What you're advertising is not, you know, it's not true, right? Uh, three could be misrepresentation. Uh, is misrepresentation. Misrepresentation just means false statements. D um, four is um, discrimination. You, you cannot discriminate against people you know, based on your you know, sexual orientation, your religion, uh, you, know, you, you know, all of that, your race. You cannot discriminate against people based on that, right? Then five is twisting. What is twisting? Uh, twisting is misrepresentation that um, convinces a policy owner to cancel, lapse, um, switch their policies or take out you know, a policy with a different insurers when it is not in the um, policy owner's best interest. For example, you as the agent, you have um, a potential client and they have term insurance. And let's say they have a $250,000 term insurance and the monthly premium is $40. Your, no, no, the, the term insurance your company offers for 250,000 same age, everything is, um, is $60. Everything else is the same, but for the same coverage, the client will be paying more, $20 more with your insurance company. If you, if you um, get the client to switch to cancel that policy, which is better for them than your policy. You, you know, you, you you tell them all kinds of lies and stuff. If you get them to do that, that is considered twisting. All right. So you have to know these terms again. Uh, what is rebidding? What is twisting? What is defamation? Defamation is um, the other unfair trade practice. It is just maliciously critical statements, mental. Um, hurt a competitor, and that competitor can be your fellow agent, or it can be, uh, you know, like a, another insurance company. So, so for example, be defamation, where you know I'm trying to sell insurance to some clients, and I'm telling them, oh, you see, Mr. Smith, that guy is a murderer, and you know, you know. He, <laughs> Well, you probably don't want to do business with him because he's a he's a murderer, he's a rapist. You don't even want him to come in your house. You don't want to do business with him, trust me. And you know, all of those are false, right? Those are false, but you're just saying bad things about him to hurt him. So uh, you can be able to get, you know, take clients away from him. If it is um, false and it is meant to hurt your competitor, that is considered defamation. That's unfair trade, pra um, trade practice. And that is something that can get your license suspended. You're gonna get a cease and desist order. If you keep doing it, you can even get your license revoked. So know these uh, unfair trade practices. Again, they're, they're rebidding, false advertisement, misrepresentation, discrimination, twisting, defamation, and unfair settlement, uh, no, unfair claim settlement. All right, question 66. So guys, as you can see here, even though you know, we do 
question at the time, but you're using the questions to study. So now you see that two, three times, that automatically sticks in your brain. Okay, uh, you, you, you remember it. So instead of you taking a file from your page book and trying to remember everything, you are testing yourself. And you, you're gonna see for you guys that take the course, you're gonna see when you, when you go to, when you have the course, these, you know, as I'm explaining these things to you, these explanations, you're gonna see them come up in other questions down the line. So you, you know, you, you're gonna keep getting retested on the same thing three, four times, and that makes it more likely to stick. All right, so 66 says, collecting premiums on behalf of the insurance company by producers puts the producer in which role? Debit, uh, that's A, B is fiduciary, C, banking, and D, security. Now, on your exam, you're gonna have some questions, no, some answer choices that make absolutely no sense. They're not even related to insurance. In this case here, yeah, we know that there is no rule called debit. There is no rule called security. There is no rule called banking. So, so these are your kind of easy questions. As I say, you're gonna have your super easy questions. You're gonna have your super difficult questions and then somewhere in the middle. So, so these are your super easy questions, right? So we know, you know automatically the answer will be B. Now on the exam, and when you when you take our course, we're going to go in, into this in detail. On your exam, you may not know all of the answer. Um, no, you may not know the answers to all of the questions, right? But what you can do is if you can eliminate at least one of the answer choices, now you have a 33 percent chance of picking the right answer. If you can eliminate two answer choices, now you have a 50 percent chance of passing. So even, even if you don't know, let's say you don't know about um, 25 percent of the exam, you don't know, you don't know it, but you're able to narrow your answer choices down to two, you have a 50 percent chance of getting at least half of those questions right, or you could even be lucky and get 75% of them right. But, but the more answer choices you can eliminate, the higher your, uh, your chance uh, or the higher the likelihood of you picking the right answer. So that's, so that's what you do. If you don't know the answer right up, right up front, do elimination. All right, so 66, let's see what is the explanation. So it says handling funds for the insurance company puts the producer in a fiduciary capacity. As a fiduciary, you are not allowed to co-mingle personal funds with collector premiums. So just know a fiduciary is someone, when you, know, um, when you think about fiduciary, think um, trust, think money. Those two things, trust and money. Because as a Insurance agent, you're in a fiduciary capacity uh, for the insurance uh, company. You're in a uh, position of trust. And you're also sometimes back in the days, I know now everything is electronic. When I do um, insurance application for clients, everything is online. I get your, your bank account information and boom, I just go online and press a button and it's gonna verify your bank account number, your routing number, everything is there, your social security, everything. You know, we do everything online. When I started off in the insurance industry and it used like a long time ago, this was 2000, you know, 2009 or so, 2009, 2000, yeah, 2009, 2010. When I started in the insurance industry, uh, about half of the applications, <laughs> I, I used to handle were actually not even half. I'll say about eighty percent of them were actually uh, paper applications. So now, now the you know, you know the the client will give you a check and all of that, and it was your duty for you to be able to um, you know sometimes to do checks, sometimes money order, but now it was your duty to 
turn that over to the insurance company. So as, as an insurance agent, you cannot mix the client's premium with your, uh, with your personal uh, funds. That is called co-mingling. And you have to know that word for the exam, co-mingling. When you mix in your personal funds with the, um, with the funds of the clients, that is not allowed. And that's something that can get your license um, suspended. So as an insurance agent, you are in a fiduciary capacity. Why? Because you're in a capacity of trust and where you'll be able to handle money or handle um, you know, clients' financial information. So we see the word fiduciary on the exam, just think two words, trust and money or trust and premiums. All right? All right. Question 67. Blank is a payment to a producer for selling an insurance contract or policy. A, premium, B, bonus, C, finder's fee, D, commission. Well, we know that this one is easy, is commission, the payment to the producer for selling. So how do producers get compensated most of the time is through commissions. All right, so let's read our answer feedback here. It says, most insurance producers are normally compensated with um, commissions. A commission is a percentage of the client's premium the insurer pays the producer for selling an insurance policy. Note, some producers who are employees of an insurance company instead of independent agents are paid a salary instead of a commission. Most insurance agents are paid a commission, but you have some who are paid a fixed salary. All right? All right. Now, let me talk more about commissions, how commissions work for, you know, this is something that will not be on your exam, but uh, just to help you new agents, you know, when you become a new agent. So, so, the, so they take a percentage of the total annual payment, uh, total annual premium payment. So let's say a client is paying $100 a month for their uh, life insurance. 100 a month times 12 months is 1,200, right? So your annual premium is 1,200. Then um, depending on what contract you have with the insurance company, they're gonna say, okay, you know what? We're gonna pay you a percentage of that annual premium. So we're gonna pay you maybe 50% of that annual premium. So now when you, when you, when you set that account up for that client, now you get paid 600 if, if you're 50% um, contract level, or if your contract level is, I don't know, you just do the math. If it's 75%, you get paid no more, right? So your commission is usually based on a percentage of the annual, you know, the first year premium. All right, 68. It says an insurer is required to obtain a blank in order to legally transact business in the District of Columbia. A, certificate of authority. B, general license. C, JR license. D, certificate of insurance. Now, as I said, we can eliminate some of these, uh, some of these things, right? We, we know there's nothing like JR license. <laughs> That, that is just a filler, just put there to distract you. So we can get rid of that. There is nothing like a general license. So we can get rid of that also. So your answer, uh, your options come down to certificate of authority and certificate of insurance. We know that for group insurance policies, the, you know, the, the group members get a certificate of insurance. So that is something that goes to uh, goes to members or for group um, uh, uh, insurance policy, right? Certificate of insure, uh, certificate of authority. That means we've given you the authority to transact insurance business in the state as a, as an insurer. So you get a certificate of authority. So the correct answer would be a certificate of authority. So let's read the answer feedback. It says all insurers with the exception of excess and surplus line insurers must obtain a certificate of authority in order to transact 
insurance business in the District of Columbia. Individuals covered under a group insurance policy receive a certificate of insurance. Again, certificate of insurance is for group, um, group insurance. Certificate of, insur uh, certificate of authority is for insurance companies. 69, blank insurance company is owned by shareholders. Remember, I told you, right? This will 100% be on your exam. You see here, DC. We we'll come to DC. Um, let's come here. You see, we we'll come to DC. We are looking here at the exam outline, right? So here, under the exam outline, you see, right here, under general insurance, it says stock and mutual companies, right? So that will be on your exam. So, blank insurance company is owned by shareholders: A, reciprocal; B, mutual. C, fraternal, D, stock. The correct answer in this case would be stock insurance company. So know that stock insurance company, when you hear stock, just think about the stock market, right? Where you have shareholders. So stock insurance companies are owned by your shareholders. Mutual insurance companies are owned by your policy holders, right? Reciprocal insurance companies Fraternal benefit um, companies are completely different. That will probably not be on your exam because it's not on your exam outline, but you can still know it, you know, just FYI. But let's go through the answer um, feedback here. It says, a stock insurance company is owned and controlled by stock owners or shareholders. So now types of insurers, uh, stock insurers. Let's, let's talk a little bit about stock. So another name for stock insurance companies are non-participating companies. Why are they called non-participating? Because, uh, uh, because the, the policy holders of that insurance companies do not participate in the dividends. So it's considered non-participating. They don't participate in the profits. So stock insurance companies are called non-participating. So they may not, on, on the exam, they may not say um, stock insurance, they may say participating. So you got to know these names, right? Um, these single names, you, know, you have to know these things. So stock insurance, they're owned by shareholders. Two, shareholders or stockholders receive dividends, but they receive a stock dividend. Also, they are called, as I said, non-participating companies. Dividends from insurance company is always you no know, stock dividends are always taxable. Why? Because they are considered um, you no, know, they are considered profit. Um, dividends are not guaranteed. So just keep in mind whether it's a stock dividend or it's a policy dividends. Dividends are not guaranteed because it just depends on how well the company does. Two. What are mutual insurance companies? Another name for mutual insurance companies are participating company because the policyholders participate in the company's dividends or, or their profit. So if the company makes a lot of money and they pay out dividends, they, they pay out dividends to their policyholders. So policy owners receive policy dividends, right? So again, for mutual insurance company, they receive Policy dividends for stock insurance company 